Hello, everybody. Welcome. It's me, Aurora. Today is October 19th, 2022, and this is Level 1, Lesson 3, The Shape of Time. But I just wanted to continue with some of the lovely, sometimes we chat a little bit behind the scenes before we get going up with class, or just casually before we start with class. We were talking about um, uh, a new student just uh, told us that um, there have been some solar activities that blew out some communication cables, and that, welcome, Joanne and that uh, sometimes that can bring on, for some people, feelings of a wave of depression. And I definitely know for some people it can bring on sleeplessness or anxiety. Hi, good to see your face. And for me, I usually feel like, woohoo, big woohoo, not to brag or anything like that, but I feel, and this is what I wanted to speak to in the recording, um, that there's waves of, uh, that there's a lot of, I just jokingly call it crapola poop, that there are a lot of things that have been inhibitors to the natural functioning of the eye of insight, eye of time. This is everything that I'm going to be teaching about today. And that uh, when those moments of solar inundation happen, solar energy is inundating our planet, a la this painting that I have over here, then I feel like, wow, like there's a, the poop goes to the periphery and all of those distractions and other things become more peripheral. And that um, pure light of awareness becomes much more focused in the center of my attention. And that's really everything that I remember from, again, when I dive back into these recordings and I almost always re-listen to my stuff that I recorded 10 years ago, I, I go back into that feeling state and I imprint again upon like who I was and what I was feeling at that time and how I was doing those recordings. And I'm like, oh yeah, like that's what it felt like. Like the the feeling of the sun felt different to me. The feeling of mental connection and um, insight felt different and easier to me. And uh, we're just to, to reaffirm to anyone who might be having feelings of challenge, like I just want to validate for you in a very challenging time, in a time when there are many, many multiple frequency signals. So how does this relate to what I'm talking about today? I'm talking about the frequency buffet. So in the recorded lesson that I have from 10 years ago, I talk about how we're, we're going to do a lot of anatomy today, your eye of time, yeah, Joanna's agreeing with me, affirming that, super challenging. Um, and yeah, of course, for anyone who might be uh, younger than 20 years old and who's watching this, I think it's really important to articulate to you that the world that you're in right now, it, the levels of difficulty and intensity, like the spiritual weightlifting, we're like 50, lifting a 50 pound weight, like just to get out of bed. It is very, very challenging just to be able to get up to levels of insight and connectedness and heart connectedness. And you definitely have to be, I would say, a spiritual athlete or a peaceful warrior to be able to even um, get to these levels of clarity and insight and perception. So many lovely people are coming in, but it wasn't always this way. It was easier. And I just, I, I might be repeating myself for people that have been in the class for a long time, but you know, so I'm a walk-in and I've been here for 21 years. So I came in in 2001. I felt what this planet felt like. The sun was um, somewhat diminished in the connection to the natural sun even then. And also I felt the feeling of what it felt like when in my local area, they started to put up more cell phone broadcasting towers. So for people that are 20 years and younger, they might not know and remember what it was like before there was this profusion of cell phone towers. So where I lived, it was a small upstate town in New York called Woodstock. There was not a cell phone tower and I was there. And then in 2005 or 2006, they put up the first cell phone tower that was in the area. And all of a sudden everyone was happy because they could have their cell phones working. Like everyone that was always like looking at the sky and be like, where's the reception? What's going on? They were all like, hooray. But what I felt was, was a diminishment of the natural telepathy. And that was just the beginning of that. So you have to recognize that what's been happening over the past 20 years on this planet or in this realm has been a frequency profusion of frequencies that are not something that they're, they're antithetical to your natural telepathy, not something that you would naturally choose to expose yourself to, but it's it's environmental or it's endemic. It is simply out there and that it's necessary, again, lift a 50 pound weight just to get up to these levels that would have been possible without that, without those inhibitor signals. So this relates to what I was just going over in my um, preparation for this class. I talk about, you know, using your eye of time and the conscious control of choosing about what timeline we're focusing on. This is just I'm prefacing what I'm going to get to in detail in my notes, um, but it's really important for you to comprehend that some things are within your control right now and some things are not. 
and that's big. And I'm here in alongside of you in solidarity. I would say that I have a very finely tuned instrument, finely tuned genetic instrument and finely tuned higher faculties. I find it difficult to find the true signal while I am here in this place with, um, let's say, things that are on the frequency buffet when I talk in the recorded class about the sense of like, you know, being at a buffet or being at a, a gathering and they've got, you know, like the waiters with the nice little things on, on the platter, like, would you like some of this? Would you like some of this? One of this, one of this, one of this. Um, and that's kind of what it should be like with our mind, with the process of learning about mind and the unfoldment of your own consciousness journey. You should be able to observe your mind and be like, okay, like here are all the thoughts that are offered to me on a platter. Which ones do I want to think? Do I want to think, of course, in the recorded lesson, I talk about this. This is still pertinent information. This is a thought of judgment about so-and-so over there, like so-and-so is so bad. They're so wrong. They don't wear the right clothes or they don't eat or drink the right things. I I, I am in judgment of them and I, dis I disprove heartily of them. You can think those thoughts, but I will tell you that those thoughts are an energy drain. Everything that I'm going to tell you about is basically about how to cultivate this level of unconditional love. I have to turn on my piano, hold on a second. To exemplify the love tone, which I play as an A note on the piano. Piano on, hold on a second. Oh, it is on. Hold on, it's playing A. Hope that's not too loud for anyone. Love tone. <clears throat> love tone, love tone. Um, yeah, the idea of um, everything that we are cultivating here being a foundation for everything that we are then able to activate here in terms of higher faculties. This is part of the teaching of today. Why is that? Why do we have to do that? And I'll, I'll share with you this beautiful image, actually, if I can find it easily. Hold on. Uh, oh, I, I almost have it. I'll use this one instead. Let's go to an image where I can show you uh, because I think that's worth a million of my flappy glove by moving mouth parts. Okay, so uh, I'll get the annotation. Great, because if I don't get it fast, it evaporates away. <clears throat> Let's find the heart at the center. Here is where I'm making this green cross. I know it might be a little bit challenging because I have a lot of lines on this particular drawing. Oh, and let me just focus this in on my face. There we go. Hold on. Where I just drew that green cross is pretty much at your high heart, like kind of slightly upward from your breastbone. And that represents the heart chakra. And following the lines up from there, I'm gonna simplify it because I know there's a lot going on in this drawing. So you can see it makes kind of a cleft. And within that cleft nestle the larger structures, sorry, smaller structures of your throat, your eye of insight and your crown chakra. So we haven't done fully in level one, all of the an energetic anatomy that this is part of, but I basically call everything from the heart upward, your higher faculties. And I'm gonna draw these kind of like wheels, like wheels of a car. And then this is kind of like the axle going through the center of your, of your head. Um, these wheels nest within the rotating energy field of your heart. So your heart creates, I'm going to simplify this a lot, but we'll get more in detail as the semester goes on, like a big plateau, like a big flat landing pad that your higher faculties rest upon. I'm gonna go back to my face and I can kind of act, um, gesture this for you. Um, so here, my heart, and this is actually a good dress to wear for this. You can imagine that I have big giant wheels of energy that are coming out from my heart and they're radiating and I'm making a natural tone by my relationship to time. And what is that tone made of? It is made by literally an equal giving and receiving as I'm moving through time. Hold on one second. Thank you, I just needed to, yeah. Yeah, I need to press a button. I need to have a notification come in. Um, equal re re reciprocal giving and receiving. That is truly what love and the love tone is defined by. So to make this a really clear distinction, 
Hey, Pedro, good to see you. I see you're just saying hi in the chat and I want to welcome you. So Pedro is a long-term student of this class and we're going to talk about game over try again, G-O-T-A. This is Pedro who taught me about that and also came up with the acronym for Putis. So thank you, long-term student. Thank you for returning and being here today. Um, had a very positive influence on, on all of us over the many semesters. Yeah, um, love is defined by its reciprocity. I give you five units, I receive five units. So let's say in terms of the rate of the flow of time, I'm moving through time at one second per second. Perfect. One second of time is being given to me and I'm moving through or, or receiving it or accepting it into me at a rate of one second per second. This is very different than the action of grasping forward in time where you're anticipating or feeling almost a sense of anxiety. What's gonna happen in the future? My face makes a, a concerned face and I start to kind of like leap ahead of this moment now. And all of this is said in love, like none of this is said in judgment. I comprehend why people feel anxiety or anticipation of the future. It is a survival mechanism because you want to know what's going to happen next because you feel like that can help you to anticipate and prepare for it. However, the best way to flow through time is not by preparing for the things that you feel that are going to come, which are going to be bad things, but is to be completely fully invested in the moment now. And same thing with being dragged back by the past. If you're like, oh, I remember that thing that happened two seconds ago or two months ago or two years ago, those you could imagine almost like tendrils. Like imagine you have like very, very long hair or tendrils kind of shooting out behind you. Those are time tendrils. And you actually left a little piece of yourself way back there, two seconds or two minutes or two years ago. And it's still kind of stretching out, stretching out all the way back there, all the little tiny pieces that you left back there, that kind of draining energy from the now and how to resolve these two tendencies. This is gonna be a very practical lesson that leads into the lesson about meditation. So anxiety and depression, these are feeling states and they are more than your biochemistry. They are habits of energy that um, the, they're behavioral and they are largely within your control, which is positive. And when you willpower about these states, then your biochemistry follows suit. So the energy happens first, then your biochemistry follows second. So if you are in the practice, as I will encourage you to be in moving through this class of being focused in the moment now, performing the love tone or receiving the love tone, being like, La, I'm in a state of love. I'm in a state of love. I'm in love with time. I'm in love with time. This is not the romantic love, which I point to down here in your belly, in your guts, where your reproductive organs are. That is romantic love that involves kissing, hugging, smooching, snug snuggle snuggling, and reproduction. All right. But this is different. This is a more universal, unconditional love that is a partnership with abstraction, with time with consciousness or awareness, with intelligence, with life force itself, with divinity, divine presence, however we would like to use a word that is palatable in a time when many people have been religiously traumatized. If I use the word God, some people go like this. I don't like that word and I'm starting to get skeptical and closing down. So that's why, although I'm very much a proponent, I'm like, yay, God, because of how I define God. A lot of people are like, ew, God. So that's why I definitely understand the emotional reactions that happen from that phonetic, symbolic word of God and what that means to some people, but I'm speaking about it in a different term. So for new students, you can just calibrate that effort from now on. Every time you hear Aurora say the word God, what I'm talking about is something that is non-human centered or non-anthropocentric, abstract, um, perfect, um, completely loving, completely compassionate, um, ha ha organized is the definition of organized intelligence, is the definition of capable, is um, the literal cr creator of time, space, matter, and upholder of the structure of the cosmos, non-arbitrary, non-capricious, non-ego-centered, and non-egocentric. And I have to say this because of many of the stories that are coming through the human filter, stories of like the Judeo-Christian Bible or the Bhagavad Gita or many different human holy writings, again, I don't mean to demean your, your human holy writings, but that they often exemplify or talk about God's behaviors and motivations as being egocentric. And a kind of like, I don't like you, I will smite you. And you can't, that is not the type of the definition of God that I'm talking about. That is an abstract presence of divine perfection and divine intelligence. Pedro has a question, it says, so God has no shape and all shapes. I would say this, God, in, from the definition that I'm coming from, does not have an anthropomorphic shape, not one face, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. 
but to me it has more of a sense of a shape of a pattern, a waveform that is consistent, perfect, logical, in that it does not conflict with itself. Like if it makes this set of assertions or this set of laws, here's cosmic laws, then all of these um, uh, therefores um, mesh with the cosmic laws, that everything that is done means something, is meaningful, is um, upheld in the higher state of intelligence and nothing conflicts with itself. And in that sense, it is a pristine system or a pristine organized thought form that makes these amazing coherent thought waves that we experience and that we can align with also. So I see God as having a form that is an abstract waveform and also being a generative presence, just like when you have a garden and you clear everything out so you have beautiful soil that is just like beautiful, fertilized. It looks like chocolate cake mix or something like that. And then it's ready to put a seed on top of that soil and have something grow. To my understanding, when I use the word God, I'm talking about that generative force field. And then our mind creates a seed, a world seed, literally. And that's part of the partnership of the love tone and the partnership that we're doing. And what, like, why are we here? Basic existential questions. I joke about this, like, mommy, daddy, why am I here? You know, these are the existential questions that young people ask, but it's not condescending to say, like, be, be like a young person questing with your mind, wondering about these things. Um, you're creating thought seeds. You're the first person experiencer in the driver's seat, literally creating thought seeds that are then placed into the generative field. And just like a seed grows into a whole plant or tree or whatever it is, your thought seed contains the um, potential to then genesis a whole reality structure out of that seed and then becoming a um, conscious intentional thinker and conscious intentional planter of seeds and also weeding out the garden, taking out the stuff that you don't want is all about the process of spiritual maturity and being on the, in the levels of refinement that I'm going to talk about today. So let me jump into the notes a little bit. This is a shape of your chakras. This is one chakra shape that is made out of two toruses or tori at 90 degree angles. They're made out of whirling and spinning uh, vortexes that are made out of the material of time itself. So um, chakras are often represented, as I've said in, in level number one, class number one, as just a glowing ball of light. That's a generalization and it's accurate, but only as a, um, a placeholder for something greater. And now this is the more detailed teaching of exactly what it is. Your chakras are made out of time. So you have several different layers of your being. Where's my lasagna? Because this is um, every single color that I need to talk about. Um, and this is review, but I go through this all the time over and over. It's how musicians learn through um, repetition. And we learn through repetition too, creating neural pathways. So you have a physical body, your cellular structure, like I'm touching my face. I know I have a face. You all have faces. Most of you all have faces. Um, this is the physicality form. And then we also have all of these other layers of being from emotional, intellectual, pure heart, which is that vibrating love tone, which was considered the pinnacle of human achievement for many, many millennia, that that was considered to be like the top level of what humans can become, that our greatest examples of people, of humans, um, achieved that level. And they might have been great teachers, masters who meditated on a mountaintop. They might have worn special clothing or been um, revered in some way. And they're worthy of that reverence. I'm only here to tell you that that's not the pinnacle of the mountaintop of achievement. That is your base camp. That is the prerequisite for then being able to enter into, matriculate to the university of the universe and learn to activate all of these higher faculties, everything from love and above. And you need to create this really firm base camp and foundation here because that is where you get your energy in order to create all of these other apparatuses of anatomy and get them all spinning the way that they need to spin. So when I'm talking to you about the waiter or waitress with their crudités that they're bringing around and some of them look appealing, that looks like a good thought. Some of them look draining. Thoughts of judgment. What am I talking about? Some thoughts literally make your heart spin less. 
And this is um, energy metabolism, not necessarily like the pumping rate of your physical pumping vessel, although the two are um, uh, uh, interrelated. And Dan Winter, I'll speak to his work a lot, has very good work about the force field and the coherence, ele measurable electromagnetic coherent force field that is generated from the heart. And people have different heart rates and different levels of muscular contraction in their heart that absolutely relates to your heart. But you can have a beautiful heart chakra, even if you have a heart murmur or some other physical defect, please never put yourself out of the running on all of this. Your heart has to do with, in human terms, it would be defined as acceptance. But I love that we have many different people that are in the IT realm that tune in. And I often use words that come from the realm of, um, um, uh, technology and computer sciences, even though you know I'm not a transhumanist, um, but what I'm going to talk about the heart as your central processing unit, as your CPU, as the central clearinghouse through which all signals must pass. It is your base camp for signals that are going up the mountain, going up the mountain to then be broadcast back to the abstract source here that has broadcast you and all experiences of reality into reality. So you're essentially taking uh, the life experience, distilling it into a signal that you can then send back to the being that is created and upheld and made it possible to have all these experiences. And also it is the central clearinghouse through which signals must come that are coming from a higher dimensional, less dense realm into the physicality realm. So acceptance in the human word, in the human world would be like saying, um, I information comes to me and I accept it. I do not deny it. I don't pretend it away. I don't stick my fingers in my ears and go, la, 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 that's not happening. Um, that means that you're allowing that information to actually come from the higher dimensional um, areas of pure insight through truth, which is what's at your throat chakra here, through your heart, and then get to your solar plexus. And here is where you have your daily waking intellect, what humans define as, as mind, but is not only your only aspect of mind, because this is your mind. This is, we're gonna talk about this a lot in this class. It's your eye of insight. I'm gonna talk about it a lot today as your eye of time. And that this is like the needle of awareness that helps you to focus on which songs are being played on the record of your life. So before you came here, when, or when you came here as a little tiny child, when you were nonverbal, you didn't yet have this fully developed yellow chakra and intellect. You didn't have a sense of your ego. You didn't have a sense of separateness from yourself, from everyone else, from the environment or from uh, divinity or from your creative presence. You had all of that. Um, you had all of that um, conscious awareness in a nonverbal state. So babies are incredibly advanced. Babies are amazing. Hug a baby if you have permission for their parents, clearly. Um, but yeah, and hug them with the sense of like, like usually we, we condescend to them, like they're very cute and they're like you know, pooping in diapers and everything. But also you have to understand like you are holding this little, um, very perfectly designed consciousness that simply is nonverbal and has access to a lot of verbal states that adult humans are um, uh, learning and spiritually growing the muscles to get back to those nonverbal states. So you're, you're becoming post-verbal, they are pre-verbal. Um, but it's a very, very beautiful mind state to be in when you're not aware of linear time. Like babies don't think like, oh, two o'clock feeding time, then 2.30 is burping time, then three o'clock is diaper change time. Like they don't think in that sense. And I'm sure that if you really go into it, you can kind of bring yourself back to that mental state of what your day was like when you just flowed from moment to moment. That's what I'm talking about. Love tone, flowing from moment to moment. And there's a beautiful level of freedom and clarity of experience there. And again, some people achieve that through molecular helpers, like, you know, if you're taking a particular psychotropic drug or whatever, I'm not judgmental about any of that. It's just not something that I do because I have to protect my brain. Um, but that can also bring people into those states of total focus on the moment now. And what that really is, is an amplification of this higher faculty that is your eye of time, that is a lens that focuses not only on thoughts and thought patterns and time roads, like the roads of time that are stretching out in front of you, um, but fo focuses on the possibilities and probabilities of your life. So wait, now I should get into a little bit of I'm going to draw the time diagram, even though I did the advanced class, like I said that um, when I was in the um, 
like when we were chatting before class began. Last week, I did level two, lesson two. This week is level one, lesson three. But last week, I did the advanced teaching all about becoming an ascended master and what this central core timeline is about. And today, I'm doing the beginner, you know, introductory teaching. So I, I hope that that's not confusing if you're, you know, watching things out of order, but it will all end up making sense. So Hello, welcome. I'm going to teach you about my time diagram. I'm going to use this all throughout the rest of the class as a shorthand for us to be able to talk about concepts that are challenging to comprehend because time is invisible. It is unless you, you know, see it on a wall, like the clock is, the hands are moving around, like very challenging to point to. It is the invisible medium through which we swim as fish swim in a river or an ocean. And it can be challenging for the mind to grasp onto concepts without having something to look at. We are very visually oriented. Most people are visually oriented learners and perceivers of the world. Like humans primary presentation of the world is um, visual, Dogs smell. So to my dog, I would have to make like a smell diagram of how to do this. I haven't done it yet, clearly, but I learned a lot from my dog from like taking her around town because my dog has a smell path. She's like, at first I smell here, then I go here, then I smell here, then I smell here. So again, um, dogs are led by scents and by visual stuff secondary. So, so if I were to create a dog class, I would have to create smells. I'm getting off topic. When I create my time diagram, I'm talking about the lower quadrant of this shape. And I show you this as a three-dimensional object. And I made this three-dimensional object so that I can do this. Here, you can see the bottom shape that's kind of you know, shaped like a pointy vortex. And this is the zeroth dimension. And we'll do building the dimensions again and again and again. So I'll re reaffirm that again and again. But if I tilt this up, then you can see that this is a circular shape that is similar to, I call it an old fashioned record. Um, the type of record that you put on a spinning record player that has, I have the gesture here. Here's like the record is spinning around and then it has a needle. And essentially the record has one long groove, let's draw it for you. And the needle picks up the sonic information that is stored in that one long groove. So let's do beautiful. I get some proper colors here. This is the membrane of death right? And then let's use um, red as the starting point down here. And this is year zero or your birth. And time marches upward or flows in that direction. And you could tell from my sculpture that its um, pathways are spiral. The spirals go all the way up and around the vortex like this, but that I, to emphasize this, I'm going to be simplifying them as pathways that just go up in a line so that that way you can see what's going on, but you recognize that with your mind, they are spiral pathways. And you also recognize that this aperture here, I've drawn it as a big fat wormhole, but it's really the tiniest little wormhole. Like I'm, my pen can't even make a dot that small. It's the tiniest little wormhole that is possible to make and it only allows through one of these timelines to go through there. So everything about this time apparatus here is a focuser of energy. And that is what your eye of time is becoming this focuser. Uh, so the topical themes that I'm emphasizing here today, focusing your mind's awareness and your sense of being on the moment now, as it exemplifies the love tone that you are moving through time at one moment per moment, and that uh, not grasping for the future or being held back by the past. And that that also gives an enormous amount of empowerment to being able to choose your flight through time. So when I look at a top-down view here, just like a record, I, I sometimes say an old fashioned analog record, and here's where the record would go on the spindle. And now let me just get a different color. This groove is your, all of your favorite songs. Let's say whatever, it's Led Zeppelin. I always use that as my example, Led Zeppelin. And every single one of these songs that's on the record, wait, I should say it like, like this. Here's the end of song one. And then here's the end of, and then this part over here, that's song two, then it ends, then the next groove, then song three, 
and then all the way up until here's your favorite song. I joke about that. It's Stairway to Heaven and then Stairway to Heaven spirals directly into here where then that would be the, um, the culminative moment or um, the wormhole out of here. So, you know, I just joke about Stairway to Heaven, but I think that's a pretty good song. Lots of people know it. Um, let's get a different color and say, this is the needle of awareness. So this is the, in the apparatus of a record player, a physical record player, this needle um, unlocks the sonic um, potential energy that is formed in the grooves of the actual record and releases them as auditory waves. These are supposed to be auditory sound waves coming outward into the room that you're in. And so again, um, the commonalities between a physical record, stored sonic information. The songs aren't playing yet until you put the needle on the record and make it go in the groove. That is exactly what's going on in your time zone, sorry, in your time vortex over here. You have all of these, I should choose the right color, all of these timelines that are songs that are in a state of potential. They haven't been played yet, got it? They are songs that represent a series of events moving through time. And that event, when you're out here on the far periphery, um, let me get out of this color. So you come from infinity up here, and then the very first place that you go to is this spot on the periphery over here. And then you travel on this yellow timeline, and then you hit the flowing membrane of death over here, because this membrane is flowing in this direction. You cannot get past that black, uh, it is a boundary. And it's a boundary that is there for a reason. Again, none of this is meant to be like the cosmic smackdown. I joke about the World Wrestling Federation. I'm gonna smack you down, jaw. It's not like that at all. And that's part of the uh, artificial uh, personification of God or deity as somehow wanting to smite you or punish you. So I'm jokingly really asking that we can move past that because none of this, what I'm drawing here is meant to be a punishment. All of it is meant to be an opportunity, truly a gift, truly a wonderful um, um, cap cap capacity, a capacitation to be in the realm of experience. So every place where I'm scribbling in purple, this is the realm of experience. It's called being alive. That is an amazing opportunity. Not everyone, not everything, not every consciousness gets the opportunity to be alive. So even the fact that you are able to enter into this time vortex and then begin to experience and make choices throughout these different quote unquote songs of you that are in the record of your life is an amazing experience. I would also like here, go back to my face. Everybody like congratulate yourself, congratulate yourself because you passed the audition just to be able to be alive. To be able to be alive is a unique accomplishment and is something that is worthy of celebration that you as a set of characteristics that I would define as soul, like who you have been over many, many, many um, existences, let's say, um, refined to the level that you now as a ball of potential are prepared and ready and worthy to actually enter into a physicality, biological realm, biological experience and begin to move through time. That is amazing. Literally, you pass the audition. So you can think of it in this way. First of all, there are many, many points of consciousness that have never been incarnated in a physical body and they might never be. Um, they simply don't have that uh, set of characteristics that is necessary to be able to do this. Like each one of you is a recipe and there is something unique and perfect about your recipe that allows you to be able to gestate successfully. Yes. And then you can also think about for every time cone, I'll just gesture with my hands here, for every time cone, where you successfully begin at the periphery because you were born, think about how many time cones where there were um, in non-successful conceptions, the sperm never met the egg or the sperm met the egg, but it did not result in a viable pregnancy. There's so many. So even if you look to um, a physical objective materialist science and you look at probability structures, the probability 
of live human birth is incredibly low, low probability. Many, 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 many more time structures exist where either you didn't, nobody got pregnant, nobody was able to gestate, baby died in the womb and it was a miscarriage. So actually getting born is like super achievement that you passed the audition and you actually got born. Then when we bring that around to what I was just drawing for you, because uh, it might be it might be somewhat bittersweet, if you're like, hooray, I went through all of these things and all of these challenges just to get born. And then I got born and then literally went up this tiny little timeline. It might've been a couple of hours or just a day and then hit the membrane of death. And now um, hat tip to Pedro, wah, wah, game over, try again. Or if you remember the old Pac-Man video game, that's the only video game that I really know, but Pac-Man kind of goes like, doo -doo 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 -doo, done. And then you have to put a new quarter in the Pac-Man machine and get it going again and start with a new life. And that is, um, again, I'm not being blithe because it is um, bittersweet to know that a version of you died immediately after birth, but then you know what happened. If I rewind a little bit, what happened was you hit the membrane of death over here. You had your life assessment, genetic sweater was unraveled and you returned to the time vortex, but from a slightly different point of view. And then you tried it again with all of the wisdom that was accrued from the failed attempt. And then guess what? Maybe you lived for a couple of months and then you died and then circulated back to the beginning. I'll just draw without erasing, but you get it. This becomes a circular path and then up, 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 and then up, up, up. Here's where you fell off your bike when you were nine years old, smashed your head on the pavement. Oh, you died. You should have worn a helmet. You learn that on the next timeline over here. And then, so whatever age you are right now, whatever decade you're in, please celebrate because maybe you made it to this spot where I'm drawing a circle now, not that you're dead or going to die, but if you've made it to age whatever, 27, 39, 45, it means that you have already explored all of these uh, miscalculations. They are miscalculations of vectors or directions as you are moving through time. Now I need to go back to this sculpture so that I can actually hold it up for you and show you what you're doing as you are exploring the miscalculations. Here's the needle of awareness. It should be going directly upward here to return back to the source that emitted you, which is also your destination. This actually stays in the same position, but what happens is your entire chakra apparatus is turned on its side. Here you are going to the membrane of death, like a couple of days after you were born. Then here you are slowly, slowly, slowly writing all of these chakras because you have many of them in your body until ah, now you've lived to age 37 and you've learned your lessons in this sense. And then eventually you are able to make your chakras be in perfect alignment so that you are in alignment with that central core timeline and the zeroth dimension, which is the source and the destination and also what I would define as divinity or divine intelligence or divine organizational presence and you return there, the, the thing, or, or, or the thing, organism, creature, or level of consciousness that created you, you return in a beautiful biofeedback loop, and you return with stories. You're like, you'll never guess where I've been, or you'll never guess what I've been experiencing, and you also are re-meeting yourself, and so it will be like, yes, actually, I do know exactly what you were experiencing, because I wrote all of those songs for you, and it is a song of eternal life. So everything where you're hitting the membrane of death, those are songs with some wrong notes. Those are songs that are kind of like, here, I'll play some bad music on the piano. Cover your ears, cover your ears. That is not a song. That definitely does not sound like a symphony at all um, because uh, real music is organized sound waves. Those are organized sound waves and playing chords. The notes fit together for a reason. They sound pretty for a reason. not random or arbitrary. Literally, the sound waves are harmonically arranged so that they have a coherence and they fit together beautifully. And that's everything that my artwork is about as well. So both music and my style of artwork is about this perfect harmonic structure and the coherence. Coherence means stick together. And I use this joke every class. It's what good waffles do. They stick together, you know, because they're like in the waffles pan and they kind of scoot over the edges. So coherent light waves stick together. And you actually are defined as a light being. 
another big teaching that would carry forward through the rest of the semester. Chakras are made of light. I thought you said they're made of time. They are made of time and time is light. Light, light is information, awareness, intelligence, and data. So when we think about when your heart is open and you're in a state of acceptance, it means that light, intelligence, data can accurately flow through the central clearing house of your heart and get to either your daily conscious waking intellect here and out here into the physicality realm or be broadcast upward back to the levels of consciousness that you emanate from, which are pristine abstract levels of consciousness that are not embodied. There's nothing wrong with being embodied, having a low vibration. That's a low note, but it's not bad. But people often equate low vibration with distorted. That people often say to err is human and humans are sinners. I don't agree with any of those things. The definition of self when in an embodied human form is not imperfect, is not like, like I'm effed up. Of course I'm effed up. I'm a human. Like, no, 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 no. So having a lower vibration or being in the embodiment of densification of having a physical body is, does not equate to being wrong or being flawed or being quote unquote, a sinner or any of those types of programs or expectations or justifications. It just means that the signal has gone from a very high vibration, high frequency, um, very fast, tiny little waveform into a much bigger, longer, slower waveform, but longer and slower, lower note doesn't necessarily mean worse. So yes, your physical body is made of matter and you're vibrating at a lower, slower rate than yourself as God self, as higher self, as higher dimensional per perspective and perception, but it does not mean that you are bad down here. And that's also big. Like I know that I'm um, on, on the class, I call it lessons for full spectrum humans. So this is early in the semester, but I am going to reiterate this. It's called lessons for full spectrum humans because you are more than just your first three chakras or layers of being, which is how humanity was defined for many millennia. You're just physicality with some mammalian emotions like love, hate, lust, you know, desire, hunger, and then a little bit of human intellect on top of that. And then as I was saying, according to my notes, that love tone being the attainment of those who are great spiritual masters. That's truthful because it took a lot to climb the mountain to get to there, but you're also truthfulness, the capacity to communicate, insight, your eye of time, which is what this teaching is all about and how that relates to pure knowing beyond words. And you are also violent, which is the highest level of what it can be and still be in the human octave. And it's where you plug in to God. It is where you plug in to that higher dimensional level of pure abstraction, pure intelligence, pure information that is not, that's completely undiluted. And the issue with doing that plugging in, like if you plugged in your intellect directly to the undiluted nourishment and information from the highest levels of consciousness, it would literally blow your mind. It would be like blowing your circuits. It would be like plugging in your MacBook directly to the sun. That's a lot of energy coming out of the sun. Let's call it 10 million units of consciousness per second, right? And your MacBook could take like whatever, a hundred units of consciousness per second. It's too much. It's an over overwhelm. And so that is what we are on this journey of, journey of radical self-love, acceptance. When you do this compassion journey for yourself, you're like, I accept that my consciousness right now can healthy, healthily embody 100 units of perception at a moment, not 10 million billion, which is what the sun is hitting out. You got it? So when I do sun gazing and I go outside, I put on sunblock, I wear a hat, I'm in the shade, because again, you don't want to fry your physical body and you don't want to fry your mind from too much direct exposure to the world of pure light, which is um, incredibly loving. Now, again, none of this is like the smackdown, too much light. You know, that whole story, the guy that made the wings and they were made out of wax and he flew too close to the sun and then his wings melted and he got the smackdown. Um, none of this is like that, no. And we can just like laugh about that because um, there's a lot of like, 
you know, like naughty, naughty, don't try to fly too high. No, we're actually on this journey of ascension that is very intentional. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Grushi, for being here. And uh, thank you and welcome you to the class. Catch the rest in the archive. Thank you. Yeah, um, your present state of being in a diminished of capacity to know and understand or comprehend and perceive is not a punishment. No blame the victim stuff. Although it is part of one's journey to be in this state and then to return to a state of knowing, like clearing your eyes and then be like, wait, now I see everything. And we can talk about the frequency banquet, which is what I was talking about. It used to be a lot easier to choose on the frequency banquet, here are the beautiful, healthy, loving thoughts that I wanna eat. Like if someone comes around literally at a party and there's all these things on the tray, there's like healthy vegetables, that's what I should be eating. Then there's like miniature chocolate eclairs, that's amazing, but you know, like that's technically not what you should be eating. Um, although it's fine to indulge occasionally. The thoughts that are on the platter naturally are also now inundated with a lot of other thoughts that come from these artificial frequencies. The cell phone towers, Bluetooth, and Bluetooth connects so many things like par parking meters. You know, you don't just put a quarter into the parking meter to park there now. Everything is Bluetooth and everything is on an app. And that's just one example of the way that Bluetooth is just a part of our world. Like there's something in vending machines too. All everything that's a tap card, everything is Bluetooth. Um, so just please know that that is all not even a chocolate eclair. That's like, I don't know what I would call it, metal shavings. Like on here, there's like crudités, chocolate eclairs, metal shavings. Like you don't want to eat that at all. It's totally not frequency food for you, um, but it exists. And so it must be recognized when you are making thought choices right now. So everybody, you're you're not a pre-verbal infant. Everybody that's in my audience right now, it, or my all of my listeners and students, audience was not quite the right word. Um, everybody who's here listening and learning, you all have a verbalization and a conscious daily waking intellect. And you also have willpower. And willpower is located at the level of orange, but it is also located at the level of yellow a little bit. They kind of both come together because your emotions are where your willpower comes from, but it's also sometimes intellectually directed. So um, your intellect can overcome your emotions because maybe your emotions are like chocolate eclairs, but you know with your mind, no, 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 those are not healthy for me. So your mind overwhelms your, uh, or supersedes your emotions. And that's really important to be able to do that. And that's also the journey of becoming a human. You are more than a pure animalistic state where you can actually make real conscious choices about what you're doing with your emotions and with your appetites and desires. Um, making choices with the mind about what the mind wants to eat. So how do we eat with our mind? You have a tendril of attention. And I also wanna come up with a very particular, well, let me share with this one. Hold on, I'll move this into the middle of the screen. Pull this picture up, tendril of attention. So this area of your anatomy, right here where your indigo chakra intersects with your violet chakra and they make a 90 degree angle. Out of that place, I'm gonna just choose the right color. Comes this amazing, it is a waveform. You could think of it as a spiral. You could think of it as a long skinny finger or something like that. Um, but it is a, a sensory apparatus that reaches outward from your uh, imagination which is also your Christ chakra, your Christ consciousness chakra, which is not affiliated with the human teachings or human churches on earth's surface right now. So it is non-denominational. Again, I'm never diminishing anybody that has a faith, deeply held beliefs, or who attends a church, that all of that is beautiful and can be very powerful and appropriate to where you are on your path. That is fantastic but this is something that is non-exclusionary. The Christ chakra is for everyone and anyone of any species and of any belief system. So you can have a Christ chakra here if you are non-denominational, if you are Hindu, if you are Jewish, 
If you are a cat or a dog, they have Christ chakras too. If you are a microbe, if you are a redwood tree, um, and it is literally what focuses your attention on a particular timeline. So just like you have the needle of awareness on the record of your life, and you have all of these different songs that you can play, you can have a song that plays where it's like, again, I joke about this, you made your coffee in the morning, got in your car, and then went out and got smashed by a Mack truck on the highway. That is one particular possibility in the array of possibilities that stretch outward, like my fingers are stretching out from literally from every moment going forward. Every moment has a fractal array of possibility structures that radiate forward into the potentialities of the future and that it is literally your tendril of attention, your eye of mind that touches on these various different time possibilities or time tendrils and then aligns with them and then plays that song, vibrates that song like you vibrate a groove and makes that thing happen in reality so that you can then experience it. So the pre-existing songs that exist in your chakras as potentialities, right, right here, that are uh, sometimes not the best options. Sometimes that is just how what life is like that you're like looking on the menu or looking at the songs or looking at the array of futures. And you're like, I don't like any of these futures. You're like, I really don't like that thing happening or that possibility or that possibility or that or that or that. That is when I talk about flying rainbow lasagna. And again, this is just the beginning of the semester and I will get much more into this, planting the seed right now for the comprehension that this is a tool for rearranging reality that when you take the basic chakra structures that contain written, you can tell I struggled with that word, um, that contain potential waveforms that are not yet in experience and you move it in a higher dimensional, dimen higher dimensional form, um, you end up with the flying rainbow lasagna and this allows you to rewrite the book of potentials of what you can experience. And that's incredibly empowering. And then for some people it's daunting because they go through this whole cycle of, who am I to rewrite stuff? Am I good enough? Is God going to smite me? Will there be smackdown? Am I allowed? All these different things. And we'll, we'll go through that too as the semester goes onward. Just know that it is the next level of attainment that is totally appropriate that you get there as long as you're not using some kind of artificial augmentation or technology or something like that. You get there through your own muscle power. That if you ever are wondering, like, hmm, like, am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to be empowered in my life? Am I allowed to rewrite reality? Am I allowed to change and transform the future or have a direct impact on the flow of time? The answer is you're embodied. You passed the audition. Good, good job. Like I'm chomping a cigar. Good job, kid. You passed the audition. Um, good job, kid, you passed the audition and you are here and you've been going through your um, spiritual muscle training to be able to get the wisdom and the heart coherence to be able to do these activities. That's it. So I will say that there are some technology using space races or multidimensional, interdimensional, semi-dimensional, what would we call them entities that use a type of augmentation, self-augmentation technology that allows them to level up without doing all of the heart coherence work. That is a challenge. That is something that I do not condone at all because everything from having a telepathy that can reach out, PS, your tendril of attention is your telepathy. You reach out and you touch on something and you can hear it, feel it, speak to it and, and receive information from it. It is beautiful, again, cosmic lovemaking or unconditional love rapport, giving and receiving, not something that is done merely for your own convenience or for purposes of keeping Tom, like gonna go look at naked people in the shower or gonna look at someone else's secret banking file so I can steal from them. Or it's not done for purposes of power abuse is what I'm trying to say. It's not done so that you can be artificially elevated like nan nanny poo poo, I know more than you do. So I'm going to take advantage of you in some way. It's not done for blackmail. That I have to say all those things because those are the motivations that keep people out of that realm. 
if you're motivated by blackmail, like you're going to be like down here. You're not going to get up to the level up here, which really requires unconditional love, which is moving towards unity consciousness, which is where like you don't want to F yourself. You don't want to be doing bad things to yourself because you start to recognize like, wait a minute, like all of these seemingly other people, they're actually me. Yeah. And then you get to the ultimate culminative moment, that culmination where you remember that you're God. And I tell you this all the time, spoiler alert, you're God. And you're on this journey remembering that you're God and you're getting to that point. And then you're like, but if I'm God and if I'm every woman, I wouldn't want to F myself. That's right. You wouldn't want to, unless of course you're going through some profound levels of self-destruction, which you might say fragments of self need healing because they're going through self-destruction because they want to F me or F someone else or any of these things. That's its own story, but that relates to the metal shavings that are on the platter of crudités that you don't want to eat. And it's a challenging time if you want to eat right at the banquet of thoughts right now to only eat the thoughts that are um, pure, divine, and they have coherence, and then they have give you longevity. So definitely in the sense of eating with your mind, thoughts are available to you, timelines are available to you. You eat them with your mind by focusing your attention upon them. So I thank every single person that is here tuned into my class or will catch my archive later because you're literally eating these thoughts that I'm giving to you with your mind. And I joke because, you know, this is called lasagna because the edge is curly like a lasagna, the edge of a lasagna noodle, but it's also apt because I am making a type of thought food or nourishment for your mind. I'm offering it to you and you're focusing on it with your attention. That's it. Like you could be watching some video about Pokemon. Like I'm just randomly choosing that. Then you would be eating Pokemon. You would be attenuating to that. You would be focusing your attention on that and on those thought structures and then bringing them in, internalizing them and digesting them and maybe even using them as a substrate upon which to build your sense of self and your future. So I'm very honored and in profound appreciation for everybody that tunes in, listens to, and attenuates to the idea structures that I am giving to you because I'm giving you healthy vegetables. I'm telling you, and they're delicious too. Like they're very good um, crudités that are on my platter over here and they're very nourishing. And so what that means is accurate information. All of the stuff that I'm sharing with you in these classes, I feel really good and confident about sharing because it comes to me from these levels of abstraction. Abstraction is when you're seeing on the anthropomorphic level and connected to the divine. So it's not just merely my own personal convenience and interpretation structure. Like I blithely or arbitrarily choose to say that everything is this way. And then I will describe it that way to everyone else. And then they will listen to me and be like, yes, Aurora, I, I understand and believe in that. Um, no, all the things that I share with you are not random or arbitrary. They are not fictional or fantastical fantasies, make makeups, or things that I just decided to think about one day. They are all things that come from that cosmic mind, the higher dimensional mind, the mind of God. And then my job, this is what it is to be a visionary artist. You see things with your inner vision or hear them auditorily or are guided to know about them and then translating it into something that other people can get. That is my challenge. Joanne says, thank you for the healthy lasagna. You are so welcome. Absolutely. Like I do the beautiful, and Pedro says, love the lasagna. I love you guys. Thank you so much. I do the really good type of lasagna that's made from like layers of zucchini and then very healthy, you know, types of cheeses and things like that. And then very healthy layers of, you know, carrots and red peppers and stuff. That's what the rainbow lasagna is definitely um, nourishing and satisfying and not junk food. Uh, my ingredients are good. I get my ingredients from up there. And then my challenge is putting them into a recipe and cooking them in the way that is digestible and accessible to other people. So that was part of my journey of being here for over 20 years now. When I first came here, I just did lots and lots of sketchbooks and I just drew all of these pictures and I would show them to people and I would just be like, here, like just check this out. I wouldn't even say anything about it. I would just be like, and they would look at it and just think like, oh, like those are interesting sketches or those are pretty pictures or that's a line drawing. And I had to kind of get like, oh, like that is not nourishment in a digestible form to them. Like they're not really comprehending everything that is coming to me that I'm not 
effectively putting it together into a recipe in some ways that the food is not really getting to them. And it really took me many years to figure out not only here's the, the, the synopsis of my journey of being an artist. I had to learn, first of all, when you're an artist, you have to put things in a frame. That is a cultural ism of this world that if you just have a thing like here, like whatever, like this is my, my lip gloss here. If you just have a thing on a table, you're like that's a stupid thing. It's not worth anything. But if you put this on a tiny pedestal with a little title that says like, you know, cherry lip balm um, and some little uh, description about it, 2022, then people say that is art. All right. Um, so I had to learn things on a pedestal or things in a frame are perceived as art. They're perceived as non-ordinary objects that are somehow uh, significant. And that if I was going to make an image as something to speak to humanity, I had to put it in a frame or on a pedestal. And even better if you put it in an art gallery, because then people know I'm going to look at something in that room, in that space that says something that's important and meaningful. So I had to do that calibration. And then also I had to learn in terms of words and vocabulary words and choosing ways of describing what I know inside, what are the things that make sense to the people of this time and place. So I had to do some um, pop culture learning because like people know a lot of things based on TV and movies. And so I had to do some kind of like, let me learn what people uh, watch here and how they relate to the world through those stories so that I can say it's just like in this movie or it's just like in this TV show. So you guys know, like I had to literally study up. I had to study up on important movies or TV shows that would give me language of analogy to be able to use metaphors and analogy and make things that are uh, accessible um, in, in, as opposed to indigestible. Uh, that's what all of this lasagna nutrition is about. So it's taken me a long time, but now I have figured out different ways of being able to use effective analogies and also doing things like my time diagrams. Because initially I would just make these very complex paintings. And then I recognize that that's kind of like, ah, like when you listen to every instrument in the symphony at once, you're like, everything is very loud and I can't tell what's going on. So what a lot of music in the symphony does is it's like, okay, here, I'll just be like this. This is what the flutes are gonna play. And then this is what the violins are gonna play. And then this is what the pianos are gonna play. But it doesn't play them all at once. It introduces the ear, a little bit of this, then let's add the next thing, then let's add the next thing. So I had to learn that I needed to share this information incrementally so that it was not total neurological overwhelm. That's ah, too much, I can't take it. Um, for the people that I'm trying to feed beautiful uh, bites of lasagna to, that is my class. That's why I broke everything up into these um, segments. So, you know, you've got 29 minute long lessons and they add up into segments. And I also learned like people need to learn over time, which no offense to anyone. That is different than what it is like where I come from, where you learn everything all at once. All right, so like when you're looking at this painting, you see everything all at once. It's not like, well, first you're gonna look at the dark blue, then you're gonna look at the light blue, then you're gonna look at the background, then you're gonna look at the foreground, then you will look at pieces of, of uh, you know, orange that are sprinkled throughout. Like you see everything all at once. That's what it's like where I come from as Aurora the Collective, or I, I, I've started calling it Aurora the Collective, but that's me, like Aurora, the waveform impulse that is at the level of stars, all right? You see everything all at once. And so I had to calibrate for how can I communicate effectively and make Make my healthy lasagna crudités appealing on the platter so that people will want to eat them, break them up into manageable increments. And then some of the other things that I do in my class. So I had to learn how people learn. And some of the things that I had to do was learn about repetition. So when I learn a song on the piano, I'm like, oh, I'm going to play it. And then I'm going to rest. And then tomorrow morning, I'm going to try to play it again. I'm going to see if I remember it. And if I remember it, then that's great. And if I don't remember it, then I'm going to be like, let's practice this part again. So um, that being said, let me go back into the zero dimension because I went through that fast on a previous um, lesson and I know that we need some repetition on that. In fact, I'm going to go over it a bunch of times. And this relates to that infinity point that is up here at the very, very, very top. Let's do, so this is like, take it from the top, everybody. Let's talk about the zero dimension. The zero dimension is the singularity. 
it is defined by its singleness and everything where I'm scribbling all around the singularity technically doesn't even exist yet. It is a contextless void. This is infinity. It's the infinity particle that contains everything, every possibility, every probability, every likelihood. It is the source and the destination and it contains all events, all people, all consciousnesses, all objects, everything exists overlapping all at once in that one tiny, tiny, tiny little place. It's so tiny, my pen can't even make that thing look small enough. It's a tiny overlapping space and that singularity exists here and it exists here. Boop. And it exists at the center of every single one of your chakras or energy centers of your body, which is here where all of these cone-shaped vortexes come together. And it exists in multiple, multiple places inside of your physical cellular structure. So if I draw, this is gonna be an atom, that's where your protons and your neutrons are. And then here's the electron shell with the little electron, uh, you know, like in its probability field over here. The singularity exists as that tiny dot at the center of an atom. Guess what? The singularity also exists. Let's draw a, almost an identical diagram at the center of every single one of your somatic cells. So this is your nucleus that contains your DNA inside of it. And this is your cell membrane. The nucleus contains the singularity. So now we're getting to this comprehension. Wait a minute. My DNA is a connection to the singularity. Your DNA literally is a doorway to infinity. Boom, infinity right there. I'm trying to draw an arrow over there. And also in your DNA, and now let's draw a super giant close-up of your DNA. Here's your DNA as one strand or one waveform. And your DNA gets super coiled uh, as a process of its natural behavior turning into a chromosome. And I'll talk about what chromosomes are. We usually look at them as either X-shaped or Y-shaped type of formations. Um, on the journey to becoming a chromosome, which is called supercoiling, dun, 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 supercoiling, like Superman, supercoiling, um, you take one of these strands and um, twirl it around uh, something that is kind of like, uh, what is it? Um, at this, a spool, like a spool that has a spool of thread. And then you curl it around another histone and then you curl it around another histone. So there becomes this curling around motion that makes a form that is almost exactly like a donut. That's the vortex at the center of the donut. All right, so my drawing might not have been that good, but you have many, many, many vortexes at the level of your DNA, and those vortexes all have at their central convergence point singularity. So that nuclei of your cells contain singularity, the atoms contain your singularity, chakras of your body contain the singularity, earth at its core contains the singularity, the sun at its core contains the singularity, all particles of light contain the singularity. The center of the galaxy contains the singularity. Every single black hole everywhere contains the singularity. It is really worthy of a lot of focus and attention. And I will talk about it extensively as this class goes on. Just keep on thinking about that. Like if you have sleepless nights, think about like, wait, the singularity is in me and the singularity is in the sun. And it's at the center of an atom and it's at the center of a photon. Like there's a lot that you can think about there instead of whatever counting sheep or whatever you're supposed to be doing. The most amazing thing that ever happened was when this point of infinity had the thought or the leap of consciousness that said to itself one day, oops, what would it be like if there was a part of me that was not here with me? What would it be like if there was a little part of me that was over here instead of everything being over here? Because remember what I told you, over here doesn't even exist. That cognitive leap creates the existence of over here, creates the existence of a new dimension and a new space that can then be inhabited or occupied by consciousness itself. And this leap is known as the first dimension. One dimension because it takes one amount of information to determine the position of a point on a line. 
This is a numbers line. You might remember this from very, very early math classes that you might not have liked when you were in grade school. But this is fun math, so I want you to erase all of the negative associations that you have with math and the number line and remember that the first dimension is your friend and that it was a miracle or a supernatural event for the first dimension to come into being. Now I will say every single other dimension that we build from that first cognitive leap is always going to be at 90 degrees. So this actually anything is 90 degrees from the initial, like that's 90 degrees, that's 90 degrees, that's 90 degrees, that's 90 degrees. The first leap can be in any direction. But after that, the 90 degree leap from the first dimension into the second dimension, we're gonna go like this. And this is our little math shorthand of a square showing that that is 90 degrees. This is the direction of the second dimension. And the second dimension is made up of many, many, many one dimensional lines lined up next to each other, just like flat pencils on a flat table or like my fingers being held together in the palm of my hand like this. And I'm going to draw a very crude plane. So that's a plane. And it requires two pieces of information to determine the position of a point on a plane. That's the X and the Y. You gotta have information X and information Y. And then we can say, what are the coordinates of that point? And then these are spatial dimensions, the first, the second, and then upward from there is the third dimension. Now you guys are probably all experts in the third dimension. You can say, which direction is perpendicular to the second dimension? You will tell me, Aurora, that's easy. It is this direction. So that would be like stacking up many, many pieces of paper or many, many playing cards or whatever we would, we would think of them as so that it creates a box or a cube. I'm drawing a really crappy cube. Hold on a minute, guys. Sometimes these pens just are challenging to work with. To really focus. Boom, it's a box, it's a cube. If you look over, if you're, if you're inside and watching this video, look around, you're inside of a cube, you're in a box. We are very familiar with boxes. We build boxes everywhere. We do a lot with the third dimension. Third dimension because it takes not only the X axis and the Y axis, but also a Z axis to be able to say, what is the position of a point in that box? This pink dot is the point that we are describing with three pieces of information. Now we're gonna get more complex. Those are the easy ones. Everybody loves the third dimension. They're like boxes, I get boxes. Now I'm gonna be hard. And I'm gonna say, how do we get perpendicular to the box? What is the room that contains the room? what is perpendicular to the third dimension. And now you have to make a super awesome cognitive leap because the answer is time. Time is the fourth dimension and higher. And what that means is we're going to draw another box over here. I know that's more of a cubic, cube, rectangle-ish type of box, but I'm gonna draw another box over here. It's a simplified box, another box over here. Imagine that these go all the way back in, in distance, all the way back all the way back, all the way back, going backwards in time, all the way back to your birth. This becomes a timeline of uh, uh, many, many, many moments lined up. So to be really clear, if you were only a third dimensional being and uh, you would exist just for one second, you'd be frozen. You would not be motion. Like, look, my hand is moving. I am not only a third dimensional being submerged in a box. I am also a fourth dimensional being on a timeline moving. My hand is moving through space. I am moving through time. So what that means is, let's go back to that pink dot. That pink dot is you. Let's draw a little stick figure here. And that little stick figure moves through time. You have one stick figure there and you've got one over here. This is gonna take a long time if I draw it all out. Let's just make dots going back. And you have one here and one here and one here and one here, and one here, and one here. And the action of your DNA, let's dance it out for you. The undulation movement of your DNA, vibrating strongly inside of the nuclei of your cells is literally what makes you bounce or jump from third dimensional box to third dimensional box through a timeline. So we've been in class today for an hour and 14 minutes. You are not in the same body that you were in one hour and 14 minutes ago. You have jumped by making your DNA jump. Boom, 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 
jump down a timeline for an hour and 14 minutes, you're literally not in the same body that you were when we began the class. Your consciousness has jumped. This pink bouncing line represents your consciousness bouncing. That relates to what I'm talking about here with the needle of awareness being on a particular groove on the record. So right now, if I just go back to my face, most organisms and objects are moving through time without conscious knowledge and control of what they're doing. For embodied DNA creatures, your DNA is constantly doing stuff. What does your DNA do? This is the first time I might be saying this in class. So your DNA is not a flat static object that is a chromosome or a, a, a X or a Y. That's what it's like when your DNA is all packed up. Most of the time your DNA is furled, unfurled all over the place, like a sweater that is unknit and it's just a bunch of vibrating yarn. And that is known as chromatin. And it literally makes a song. That's my song. It's a song of my DNA. Song of my DNA is playing. Your DNA is constantly vibrating in exactly the same way that piano or guitar strings vibrate. And it replicates itself in loops, snips those loops. It makes itself come together. It splices, it unsplices, it um, twists and untwists. And what it's doing is your DNA is at times tightly coiled up like a scroll that cannot be read by the RNA messengers. And in order for pages to be unfurled and read, you need to snip it because there's a ton of energy held like in a tightly coiled spring. So you go snip, snip, and then that all relaxes. Ah, now this part can relax and come open and be read. And then uh, things get moved around, things get shifted, and it's time to re-enzymatically stick those pages back together, stick those pages back together, and curl them back up. And all of that is happening throughout the trillions of cells of your physical body structure and in a pattern that is definitely beyond what science can presently perceive, an incredibly complex pattern that would be considered creating it or requiring an enormous amount of processing power or RAM, random access memory. You are a smaller fractal processor in a giant biological supercomputer. And just the action of you being alive and moving through time and having your DNA um, read itself, replicate itself, do all these arabesques, it does back bends, it does swan dives, it dives into itself, it undives out of itself, and then comes back together. All of that action and movement of your DNA is what makes you bounce through time. So the difference between you as an alive being and a dead corpse lying on the ground is that you have a vibrating DNA structure that's doing stuff and going someplace. It is propelling you through time. And the dead rotting corpse on the ground does not have a vibrating DNA structure. It might still have genetic material, but that's like saying my guitar is sitting there in the corner and no one is playing it. You got it? You are a DNA structure or a set of vibrating strings or a harp or a piano with an amazing musician that is playing it and that is causing you to bounce through time. So again, you are a third dimensional creature. You are experiencing space, the spatial dimensions, one, two, three uh, dimensions, and you are also a time creature. And I'm just gonna finish this up because I always get to the fourth dimension and the fifth dimension, and then kind of just scribble on the screen after that, but let's really go. So the fourth dimension is a timeline. And then to continue this, um, I want to say paradigm, it goes point, line, plane, a point, turns into a line, turns into a plane, and then the plane turns into a box, and then the box becomes the point for the next structure. So what we're going to just continue to repeat that pattern. We started with a point, then one dimension was a line, two dimension was a plane, three dimension was a box, lined up many boxes, lining up many boxes made a line, a timeline. Now I'm going to draw many timelines next to each other, and what you get is a time plane. And that is the fifth dimension. And then that fifth dimension means that you require five pieces of information to be able to describe the position of an organism or a creature on this timeline over here. But I am very, very clear when I talk about the fifth dimension, I'm not talking about 5D as it is um, promoted as a thought structure in the new age world or spiritual aspirants that are like, I'm going to 5D, equating it with the type of fantastical paradise. 
5D is a place that you already inhabit. It is actually a place of waveform potentials. So although I'm drawing it here as a plane and you're imagining it like a piece of paper or a playing card, it actually is a waveform potential. So now is when you might need to be less literal in your comprehension of my diagrams because if this timeline here with the little stick figures of you is like a French bread, what and that French bread is baked in the uh, bakery of reality. Um, one long skinny French bread where you've got, you know, one side is your birth and one side is your death and you just have one long skinny French bread. Um, but the fifth dimension and higher is literally the bakery of potential where the dough of reality is created. So the fifth dimension is a place where you would have water and flour and a giant mixing machine that would go around like this and make a big giant blob of dough. And what you are doing in terms of your quantum observership is you have ovens in front of your eyes that are looking at the dough of reality, the uncooked potential of waveform realities and the activity, which is a co-creative activity between yourself and God of looking at these potentials is what quote unquote collapses those waveforms, even though collapse is not really the right word, but solidifies or potentiates those waveforms into something that can actually be experienced, a timeline of reality structures that you can then bounce down in terms of actually experiencing. So your observership, you're attenuating with your attention upon these various different timelines, literally creates them into reality. There's the potential for futures that you can experience. You activate or actualize those potentials and then literally drive on those roads of time. Let's go upward. What is the sixth dimension? The sixth dimension is when you take this time plane. All right, so let me just, let's draw it down here. That blue plane is this blue plane over here because I'm going to be draw it small so that you can actually see what I'm doing. The sixth dimension is when you stack up many time planes into a time box. All right. And then that becomes the sixth dimension. So we need to have six pieces of information to determine the position of an experiencer within that reality structure. And it also means every single one of these flat fabrics of reality, like if I have a orange event, it's like a needle sewing through these layers of fabric. It's a timeline bleed through. There are events that happen that affect timelines. Uh, my words are failing me. When you have an event, something like a nuclear war, and that's over here on this timeline over here, the very first layer of time that it affects is like the strongest, most profound uh, impact on time. But then as you go down through these other layers of time, it gets diminished. So the first one, it's a nuclear war, ah, everybody dies. The next layer of time, it's just a regular explosion. Thousands of people die. Go down one layer of time more, it's not that bad at all. Like somebody dropped a cup of coffee in the morning, the coffee spilled all over the floor. You got it? Like it, the disaster is diminished, the, the time, the event is diluted is a better way of saying it. So if I put something on this timeline plane up here, it's going to have a reverberative effect through all of these layers. It's gonna cause shifts and uh, reality structure um, impact, but the impact is diluted the further you get from the epicenter. So that's big, that is the, that, the, that's what's happening in this time, essentially a time tapestry, time cube is a many layers of fabric put together into a time tapestry. And then what do we do from the sixth dimension? Then get in color, then we build many boxes in a row. So this is a box, every single one of these green squares now is going to be a box, 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 because the sixth dimension is now acting as a point and we go point line plane. So the sixth dimension is a point, line up many, many six dimensional time tapestry boxes into a line and you get a seventh dimensional timeline. And then we will line up many, many, many seventh dimensional timelines into an eighth dimensional time plane. 
and the eighth dimensional time plane will then have many, many, many eighth dimensional layers of time fabric stacked up on top of itself to create, oops, an eighth dimensional time box, time cube. And then that time cube again acts as a point in the beginning sequence of a long sequence of time cubes that all go backwards. This is all descending backwards into, you know, uh, antiquity. That's the ninth dimension. Oh, my pen isn't working. Ninth dimension. And that timeline of ninth dimensional time cube tapestries then get, so it gets to the greater and greater levels of complexity into a time plane again. And then it becomes a 10th dimensional time plane. I don't know if I'm driving you crazy yet. That becomes a 10th dimensional time plane. And then upward from the 10th dimensional time plane, we stack up many, many time planes that are made out of timelines that are made out of cubes that are made out of time tapestries into an 11th dimensional time box. And then that time box acts as a point, and then that point becomes the first point in a layer of cubes that are just like this one over here, which then gets stacked up next to each other into a plane. And this is actually an infinite series. I know, as, as I said, at the end of this, I will just scribble on your screen because um, we get to these layers of complexity that's a bit big. If you want a really great video series that you can check out, it is still on YouTube. It is by Rob Bryanton, B R Y A N T O N, imagining the, I think he calls it 10 dimensions. So he brings this understanding up to the teaching of the 10th dimension. And it is very valid, very creative, great animations, and hat tip to him on his good work, worth checking out. And again, these are YouTubes from maybe eight, nine, 10, 11 years ago, but the information that they share is um, uh, always in style. It's never going to go out of style. It's always going to be uh, effective and um, uh, appropriate. It's always going to be a great outfit to wear, wear it to any occasion, like whatever. Um, I was going to say, uh, uh, like a traditional tuxedo. It's always going to look great at every occasion. All right. Why am I emphasizing all of this for you today? Because here I have drawn for you this basic simple time diagram that is made out of timelines. Each one of these timelines is made out of boxes. And each one of those boxes is a moment. Sometimes I call them train cars of reality because they remind me of a, a twilight zone that had train cars of reality that you jump from one train car to the next train car. And that train cars have also these little connectors, little squiggly lines. So train cars are discrete moments and they are separated uh, according to the plank length. And the plank length is an incredibly small um, uh, digit. It is 10 to the negative 35. It is smaller than the width of a proton in a subatomic particle. So these are the smallest slices of the cake of time that you can possibly slice cake into and still call it cake. If you slice it any smaller, like you don't even have a crumb of time anymore. Yes, you only have, I don't even know what we would, we would define it as. So that is literally what, and I'll actually get to your questions too before I just smoosh past them too fast. Those moments, those discrete moments, like those are your third dimensional boxes and the activity of your DNA is what is propelling you from box to box. And I also say this every time I share about this, you don't really have to willpower that it can happen autonomically, just like you're breathing in your heart rate, where you're just doing your thing. Like I'm driving along the road, I'm drinking my coffee, I'm looking at the street signs and my DNA is naturally without a lot of willpower or conscious effort involved, propelling me from moment to moment. The activities that we do unconsciously or sub or super consciously can be claimed as an act of willpower. And that's what all of these teachings are about. Meditation and mindfulness, choosing the thought structures that you want from the buffet or hors d'oeuvres tray of life. And then also flying rainbow lasagna, which is like, what if you were like, I don't like any of these hors d'oeuvres. I wanna to talk to the kitchen. Like none of these look good. And some of them have strange adulterants in them. Let's get that weird stuff out of there. Let's change the recipe of what it is. So wait, let me scroll on back. Hold on, I don't know how to scroll. All the way back to Pedro. 
at 2.43, again, thank you for being here, says, sometimes when I can't solve a problem, I go do something else and I return later. Can we do the same with our current timeline when we keep hitting the death membrane and jump to another timeline and then return to finish the difficult timeline? Beautiful question. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your thought processes and opening the door for this larger conversation. So if I go back to uh, this basic time diagram without all the scribbles on it, Let's say you've got, as Pedro says, a difficult timeline over here. This one where you're like, going great, going great, going great. Okay, some crap blockage, don't know what to do. You're like, how do I do it? What do I do? So first of all, you can definitely get information from your parallel timelines, from this one where I'm making a scribble and from this one where I'm making a scribble. That is absolutely the journey of consciousness and the refinery of your consciousness that it's not merely a linear journey where you're like, first I did this, then I died. Then I did this, then I died. Then I did this, then I died. And I had all those three lessons under my belt. What can really happen is you can get information from the periphery. And I've done this exercise in class already. In your eye, you have a focal point that is called your fovea where you have the most concentration of rods and cones receptor cells. Then sprinkled around the edges, you have the periphery where you have peripheral vision, you have very few color sensing cones, many, many color sensing rods, sorry, movement sensing rods, but not very much else. And so if you want to do a sensing of where's your peripheral vision, kind of hold out your hands and your fingers to the sides, like as if they were coming outward from your ears and focus on the screen. That's my, my face right here. And then slowly move your hands and your fingers until, oh, I can see them. I can see my fingers wiggling. That's your peripheral vision. And you can't really see everything that's going on. You just see a little bit of movement. Something is happening there. That is what everything about this time vortex shape is about. This periphery, the edge of the record of your life, it's not just the sense of you died, something bad happened, something was out of your control. It's the periphery of who you are, not the central core definition of who you are. Everything about this shape represents of refocusing the way that um, a lens can bend light because we're bending light, time, information, bending light until it is one coherent laser beam. All of those versions of you, not the real you. They're not the real personality characteristics and they're not the real events of your life. So if you were a tiny baby and you got exposed to whatever, some kind of disease, a bug that went inside of you and killed you, that's not because you're a good or a bad person or worthy or unworthy or anything like that, that we look more in terms of characteristics that are at the adult level of what keeps you alive on a timeline, that many of those aspects of self were simply about just learning, like your body just learning to stay alive and learning to be in a human body experience here, be embodied and stay alive and the biological sense, um, not the goodness and badness of who you are. But you can take lessons from the periphery and apply them to your present circumstance. And sometimes you hear that level of guidance. So I have lots of things that people have shared with me over my, my life and over my experience. Um, basically stories of like, they had a very strong intuition, a gut feeling down here in their orange or something that told them inside either don't get on that plane or don't walk down that alley alone in the middle of the night or don't get in that person's car or even don't take that job or don't marry that person or don't do whatever was that thing that would have led to their certain peril, to would have been like jumping over a cliff. And um, sometimes it was even to the point of like extreme nausea where they were like gonna do a thing. And then they got this really strong uh, sense of like, I can't make that decision. I can't do that thing. I can't, I can't marry that person. I'm going to leave them at the altar because they had such a strong aversion to being on that timeline. They literally, had to make a different choice, otherwise they were gonna die. And that's just like that, that O-S-H-I-T moment when you're like, my car is gonna hit a brick wall. I don't know what to do. Like you have to do an immediate course correction to be, be able to stay alive and not hit a brick wall. So the real answer is to Pedro's question is that you can very consciously receive information and guidance not only from yourself as higher self as God self in another dimension, 
kind of sending these signals from a higher dimensional source of intelligence. Because that's what we're supposed to have throughout our whole entire life. We're supposed to have GPS, God positioning system that tells us where to go, what, what to do, what to look at, what to know, what to do in every moment. Like it's actually, that's, that's in the pamphlet, the way it is supposed to be. That's in the brochure. But things are not as they have been described in the brochure right now. And sometimes there are also metal filings on the um, crude tape tray over here. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot of things that have been going on for many millennia that have been making it not as described, um, but things are in the rectification event. Um, so just please understand that we were always supposed to be completely connected to this beautiful guidance system that would tell us at all times what to be doing and how to avoid the membrane of death. So really there was a time before death was it, it not invented, but experienced. There was a time before any of us ever experienced death nobody ever hit the membrane of death because we all had the best GPS telling us where to go and what to do at all times. And things are different now. We are coming out of that time of diminished signal from above and we are reconnecting to that beautiful consciousness broadcast that tells us what to do at all times accurately, lovingly, and to keep us alive and healthy and coherent. So in lieu of that total state of connection to the above, above is in air quotes, um, there's a connection to the periphery where you're like, oh, I can actually talk with that parallel version of self that got in that guy's car or person's car, whoever it was, questionable individual's car, um, and then uh, didn't survive, didn't survive the journey for whatever reason, ended up dead in a dumpster or some other dark, dark potential, not to go down too many dark roads when I try to be lighthearted here but um, made choices that did not con mean continued life and continued longevity and coherence and a continued journey of learning. And those peripheral selves, they will be shouting at you. They will be like, um, don't take that drug. Like go into a party and someone's like here, like want some drugs, 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 drugs. And there's a peripheral version of yourself that's literally shouting at you like from the membrane of death, don't do it. Don't be like me. Don't make that choice. Make a different choice. Make a better choice. So we definitely can receive information and guidance from the periphery. And that's not only the failures, quote unquote, equations that did not add up to eternal life, but that also is from the versions of ourself that are more coherent, that are moving inward towards the uh, levels of ascended mastery. So here, this guy died. And he's telling you, don't be like me. Don't take those drugs. This guy over here is doing great. He's going to go on even longer, you know, before uh, he gets to any problems over there. This guy can give you some good advice. He can tell you, yeah, uh, you're going to want to eat some broccoli or do whatever to stay healthy and, you know, whatever, avoid these other things that are going to uh, shorten your life. So this guy can give you solutions and there's more. So that's just within your own time cone of recognizing that you have multiple versions of yourself surrounding you that you can draw upon and speak to you. When you fly in rainbow lasagna, you can not only vibrate with and connect with those um, lateral versions of yourself, you can connect with beings that existed 10 or 20,000 years ago, linear time or that will exist as waveform potentials in 10 or 10,000 years, that you can lasagna with many different viewpoints that again, spoiler alert, are all you, but that you don't know that they're you yet. And that what you're doing is taking a scoop of comprehension and viewpoint from them and putting it on your plate of right now and being able to get the comprehension, um, trans transformative information, and change your trajectory by talking to them. By And when you do that, you're not stealing and you're not killing. So big, 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 big. So again, if I play music, you're eating that music with your ears, but you are not eating my actual piano. You got it? Nothing is lost. If you read the book of someone else or another version of yourself, and you get ideas or insight from them. You are not eating the pages of the book. You're eating the information that is contained within those pages of their life. So that person's life remains their life. You're not stealing 
we're taking something, we're taking some energy away from them. That's very, very big. What you are doing is receiving insight, information, and comprehension from their journey. But that, again, is not the same as like, like if you eat a piece of a chicken, like the chicken doesn't have its wing anymore. You ate it. It's gone. It's in your tummy. Uh, when you eat information, the original source of the information remains pristine. You got it? So um, yeah, you can get information, inspiration, um, and guidance from all of these different places and from all of these different directions as you are going through your own life. And Melissa, this is again a comment from a little while ago in my presentation, but so apt. And thank you for being here and for your great thoughts. It says, remind me of tardigrades being able to rearrange itself. So that's coming up in a few more lessons, but let's talk tardigrades. These are these little tiny microscopic multicellular organisms that are also known as woolly bears. Let me see quickly if I have a picture of them. If I, if I'm, I'm very, very organized. If I can pull up a picture quickly then uh, I could share it. And if not, then I'll save it for another day. But let's see if I can find a picture of a tardigrade. It's in my folder. I'm squinting and scrolling. It's squinting and scrolling. Squinting and scrolling. Let's see if it's here. Mm, no, it's not here on this. But I can get it from my other computer if everybody wants to wait. Wait, and I know I make silly funny faces. Hold on a second. Brief pause, but it was worth it so I could get this super cute picture of what a tardigrade looks like. There you go. They're really cute, right? I mean, look at that face. Yeah, so they're incredibly microscopic, but they are multicellular, and they are some of the only organisms that can manage to survive actually being in space without like a spaceship. And there are, I hesitated there when I was speaking, not as coherent light beings, like I'm a coherent light being, I travel as an impulse of light on the network of light, I survive in space, but I'm not like a woolly bear. They are multicellular organisms that can survive in space. What is special about them is that they get, when they get desiccated, totally without water, they dry up, but they don't die. And their DNA chops up into various different pieces, kind of fragments. And then when they get water again, they kind of like, zoop, like they come back to life and um, they incorporate new DNA into their fragments. So as they're kind of like putting their DNA back together as it's getting hydrated again, they're like, oh, like, while well, I'm at it, I might as well take like a little bit of that and a little bit of that and kind of stick it all in here together. And so they do very interesting, it's called lateral gene transfer or horizontal gene transfer. And that is different than um, when you have uh, genes that are passed through multiple generations of reproduction. Mommy passes it on to daughter who passes it on to granddaughter. That's one level of reproduction and gene transfer. But what if mommy can desiccate herself, break herself up into 10 million pieces, get some new pieces, new puzzle parts, and put the new puzzle parts in with the old puzzle parts and then kind of rehydrate everything. That is what tardigrades do. So very interesting and profound, um, uh, what is the word? Um, repercussions or implications of an organism that can do something like that. Um, Pedro asks, do you only solidify timeline reality for yourself or can you do it for others too? Dun, dun, dun. Questions about observership. Observership affects everything but and there is the epicenter me observing myself i'm the epicenter of my reality i observe my reality and observe and create my reality most strongly from myself but and also i'm observing my dog and i'm creating her in my reality but she is also self-sentient she is sleeping in her dog bed she is creating her reality around herself tree outside of my window I'm an observer, I'm creating that tree outside of my window, but it's not just a dead object. The tree is creating itself through its own sense of observership. So the tree has um, more power in terms of creating its own and defining, creating and defining its own existence and its own life trajectory than I do as a non-embodied outside observer of its life. And all of that is different than something, let's say, an inanimate object. My cherry flavor lipstick over here, that this is not a sentient object. It is a molecular object. So I have greater levels of power in terms of observing it or non-observing it or placing it into or out of existence than it does for itself because it technically doesn't observe itself. Boom. We can go into all sorts of sticky questions about computers 
digital intelligence, whether they have observership, how much they are affecting themselves or their own calculations or what are their levels of creativity, but basically to be an observer that creates in reality, you have to have creative life force energy. And we get this creative life force energy right now indirectly from eating food that comes from pure light and from the sun and the stars. But there was a time when we used pure, pure, pure light, pure essential awareness to fuel our physicality presences and that we did not have to use intermediaries to be able to um, use observership and create reality and be divine co-creators in the world. So a lot of this has to do with whether you are a person, being, organism, creature that has access to creative life force energy that is your own. Very different than being a parasite because again, I'll go into the putis and those peripheral occupiers of the interstices they're there for a reason. Like you pass the audition, you have a body. They specifically do not have bodies for a reason because they are not supposed to be using creative life force energy because they would not be creating good things with the creative life force energy. And that is fair to say. They not only did it pass the audition, they smashed their guitars on stage and they said like, I'm kaput. I'm not doing anything here. That's why they are where they are, which is even different than the sense of a biological organism that has gone to the membrane of death and is in the process of dissolving and then returning on another journey to see what they can do differently and better. We're talking about the stuck consciousnesses that are not evolving or trans transforming into higher levels on their journey. Um, that they there's a reason why they don't have life force energy, but they're like, hey, nice life force energy you got there. Can I have some? And the answer is no. You know, the answer is really a big hard no on that. So um, energetic boundaries, we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, Rose asks, how do you know which timeline you're on? Really good question. So in our non-physical bodies that are made of pure light, we have many multiple chakras like this. And I think I showed you some good pictures and I'll just, I'll just briefly show you again today. Multiple chakras that are affiliated with different parts of your body and affiliated with different colors of the rainbow, but which really all nest together like this and converge in your heart. Boom, I don't know if you can see this guy, move it up, there we go. All of these layers of being actually all converge in the center of your being here. And that what is really going on when you are on a particular timeline is sometimes these um, formations are slanted. And that means that you are heading in a particular direction and that the orientation of these timeline structures can change and shift depending upon what are your thoughts and your feelings. So in my notes and in the recorded class, I have a lot to say about the concept of epigenetics and I will write it out for you for learning on a um, intellectual level right here. Epigenetics, the prefix epa meaning uh, a phenomenon within a phenomenon. It is the code that rules the code. So all of this teaching and sharing today is to get you to comprehend that you have a pre-existing record or book of your life, a pre-existing genetic structure. But that is not to say that you are genetically fated or merely determined to necessarily experience certain things that Bruce Lipton is a, a scientific researcher and he's done a lot of good work in forming a bridge, cognitive bridge between people who were taught like, hey, hey kid, if it's written in your genes, it's gonna happen. Like you're gonna get cancer, you're gonna get heart disease, you're gonna get diabetes because your mom, dad, or grandpa had it or whatever is a physical characteristic that they had that you're then going to have. And none of that is truthful because that is a cognitive program that says just because something exists as a potential in your DNA does not mean that it has to be manifested into reality. So here are some ongoing topical themes. The fifth dimensional waveforms of potential that are then manifested into reality with your quantum observership and the ovens in front of your eyes. The songs that are on the record of your life that are not yet played until the needle of awareness actually goes in the groove and goes around and elicits those songs from their state of potentiality. And then the um, cognitive concepts 
that are not yet embodied until you actually open your mind to them and embody them, thought, actual thought structures. Um, so none of these things are inevitable. Of course, if you are unconscious or not conscious of what's going on, you're much less empowered. You might be like, oh yeah, grandpa had heart disease and it's just gonna happen to me too because that's just the way that things go. No, that's not just the way that things go. But if you believe that, then that will be the truth that you will experience, which will then exacerbate or ag agonize, meaning um, amplify that truthfulness as it is going through time. And then everyone will say, look, heart disease gets passed on through generations. Um, but no. And same thing with addictions and same thing with other what, be, what would be considered negative or harmful personality characteristics that don't add up to coherence and longevity that there are a lot of things like what killed the previous generation that don't have to kill you and not simply because you have better exercise or nutrition, but because you have access to a better sense of thought structures. So I, you, Rose might be asking this question on the sense of like, do I, it, how do I know what timeline I'm, I'm on? Do I feel a sense of impending due? Should I move timelines? Should I change timelines? And the answer is so like, you know what timeline you're on. You're like, I'm married to this guy over here or this woman over here. Here's my job and what I go to every day. And then here's my other defining characteristic, whatever, like the car that I drive. But you know, any of those features or characteristics of your life can change. You can make a choice and be like, I don't wanna be married to this person anymore. Or I don't wanna be at this job anymore. Or maybe the job says, I don't want you to be at this job anymore. Or maybe your car breaks down or crashes. And then you say, I don't drive this car anymore. Those are all timeline shifts. Um, and this is wonderful. Pedro says, okay, everyone solidify the timeline that's getting rectified and the putis are sent to entropy. That is exactly what we want. That is the collective art project that I have been working on and inviting you all and encouraging everyone to be a part of for the past 21 years. Like that makes me so unbelievably heart happy when I see you write that comment and that statement. Like that's everything that my work is all about. Um, it is the sense of a, an enormous rectification event where uh, we'll get into this more in this semester, but the basics of it are that there are some consciousnesses, organisms, or characteristics that are kind of smeared on the membrane of time that are unresolved, that are definitely in a level of suffering and that have caused a lot of suffering to you and I and many other embodied creatures in their misappropriation of energy and misdirection of energy and twisting and distorting of the events of time for their own purposes. And that the answer of all of this is really not an endless dualistic struggle. Like you punch me and then I punch you and then we punch each other forever and ever and ever. Um, it is actually supposed to be a rectification where they get what they need, but what they need is not actually energy. What they need is actually entropy, which is going into a state of stillness and non-being and allowing the energy that should flow naturally to be liberated to go where it is supposed to go. So that is the ultimate envisionment using your quantum capacity. It is like, I call this being a, a peaceful warrior. It is a spiritual battle. And what you are doing is using your own divinely connected, innate empowerment observership to collapse waveforms. And you don't have to collapse waveforms where again, endless dualistic opposition and fighting and fighting across time. I actually will tell you, spoiler alert, We've already done this across many multiple dimensions. Like, remember that war? We fought that war over there and then we schlumped over into this dimension. Then we fought this over here and then it bu bubbled over into this dimension, like the way that, you know, like peanut butter and jellies, like squashes out the sides of the bread, like you squish the bread and it all comes out the sides. Like we have had many, many, many wars and all of the suffering squished out the sides. It was not actually resolved. And then it ended up with us here. And now we're doing it again, metal shavings on the platter of crudités. What is going on with this frequency war? And we have an opportunity in this moment to use the power of our creativity and observership and divine connection to say this time it can be different. They can go to entropy. And that actually is one of the most beautiful things you can paint with the paintbrush of your mind. I mean, amazing, really profound and hopeful because many people are in existential ennui in the sense of another time loop, like I'm making this space, like another more suffering, another 
more injuries, another, more trauma. And I'm like, no, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. You have a new opportunity. This is the food that I'm putting on your plate that you can eat if you want to. The idea of a new opportunity where you don't have to endlessly go through the same struggles of the past. And this also relates to, you know, I'm teaching you about time cycles and you're cycling through basically every single wrong note of the piano until you finally get to the right note that you want to get to. So it's also like saying you start off with your chakras at a canted angle, and then through many, many, many explorations of the time field, get those chakras into alignment like this. And then when you're going up the central core timeline, you are aligned with God, the zero dimension, the source, the destination, divine intelligence, that then you don't have to keep on dying anymore. And that is... Uh, that's liberation. And so I meta liberation. So I wrote that music. Um, meta liberation. And it also means, like I told you, there was a time before anybody explored the membrane of death. Nobody died. Nobody died. That was an amazing time. Everybody inevitably returned to the source that emitted them. And it was inevitable. And it was also a very beautiful journey. Like, you know, when you go on some kind of a amusement park ride, you're like, it's on a track. Like, you're going to start here. You're going to go through here. Mr. Mr. Toad's wild ride. Blah, 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 and then you get back to the beginning where you came. It's like, there's no sense of like, you're going to somehow jump off track and go into the water where Mr. Toad lives and then just be stuck there or something like that. Like that just doesn't happen. It was an inevitability and a great comfort in the sense of, yes, you will be on this circuit. You will be on this circuitous journey that it, in, it inevitably leads you back to the place, person, cre creation, creator, or sense of self that emitted you. And again, you come back with stories. You're like, I have been on a wild ride. I can't wait to tell you about all the things that I've been through. Um, so it is a, a beautiful time circuit not an imprisonment. Um, I have a little bit left to go in terms of time for right now. I want to do a little bit more of drawing um, the experience of death. Let me clear this all out because I'm sure every single person in this uh, class or watching this, clear everything out, has had an experience of someone who you love dying. And I'm just going to draw a simple diagram. We're going to have person red over here, and this is their timeline and the experience of their life. And we'll use purple as like the um, divine timeline that brings you back to the zero dimension. And then we'll use green as another life, that this is a different person having a different life experience, and that they also have this perfect timeline over here that exits their reality and brings them back home. But you can see that they have only a limited area of coincidence. Coincidence in this sense being the math definition of that word. They coincide, they overlap, not coincidence as random unconnected possibilities, coincidence as two things happening at the same time. So in the area that I scribbled in black, these two people's lives can meet. They can meet at a coffee shop. They can fly to Paris, France together. They can do all sorts of things together. But what they can't do is be on the same timeline if one is living over here and one is living over here because that's outside of the area of coincidence. So I had a cat many years ago at this point, like five or six or seven years ago. And let's say my cat is this lifetime over here in red, and I'm the lifetime over here in green. And I loved my cat very much. But what happened one day was she went outside and got attacked by another animal. And to my viewpoint, so here is my cat, Miss Ashley, she hit the membrane of death over here. Her timeline did not extend upward. But what actually happened was she was going at an angle. Here's the angle of her chakra was going like this, right? At a slanted angle. And what actually happened was she started to go at a more aligned angle. But when she did that, she went on to a timeline that exists in her time diagram that does not overlap and coincide with me. So what happened was she focused her awareness away from me, but towards life. This is very big. Again, we no longer occupied and overlapped the same shared reality structure, but she continued to exist or continues to exist here in this level of reality where she is heading towards eternal life and eternal existence. The only problem is none of my green timelines overlap with that 
And although I love and care about her a lot, to my viewpoint, she is gone. She died. Her DNA is not moving in her body on this timeline where I am. This is a big, big teaching here. And it speaks to the grief that happens when someone else's attention, soul, and focus of their being focuses away from you. So when you have your chakra at an angle like this, and you're hitting the membrane of death, and then you're like, okay, I learned that lesson. I'm going to focus up like this, and I'm going to be like this. What it means is you're focusing towards your divinity. You're focusing towards your life as an ascended master, ascended master cat, ascended master dog. I include all of these beautiful organisms, ascended master planet, ascended master tardigrade, microbe, planet, galaxy, whatever it is. Um, but when you see a version of an organism that has died, what is happening is you're in the reality structure that they focused away from. They focused their attention, boom, boom, boom on a different timeline. That is a timeline that has more coherence and longevity that will continue to bring them forward in reality. But what it means is that you no longer have that area of overlap where you are both experiencing reality together. That's a really difficult heart and emotional lesson because we form bonds of attachment and we love to see things and people and even trees in my neighborhood. And when I see them get chopped down, I'm like, oh, like they chopped down that giant eucalyptus tree. This makes me so sad, sadness of the loss. But what actually happened was that eucalyptus tree is still alive, but it is alive in a different level of reality. It has an ascended master timeline where it never dies. But guess what? I'm not overlapping there because you know what? I might be the one that died to its viewpoint that on the levels of reality where that tree is still alive and didn't get chopped down, I might've been smashed by a Mack truck on the highway on that day. And that's why I focused away from that timeline. I can't be on that timeline where the tree is still alive because I need to be still alive. I need to be on this timeline over here. And that means that tree died and my cat died many other organisms have died according to my first person experienced viewpoint but and i also recognize that they are alive in a different layer of reality and what ends up happening in this time diagram is everybody meets at infinity because the singularity is only one singularity so although i have drawn it as if there is this squiggly purple line of distance in between these two singularities this giant purple dot is actually the same exact giant purple dot as this one. There is no space between these two singularities. So what we're experiencing in our life journey is a focusing of awareness. I'll go back to my hand so I can just gesture this for you. As each person's life and life trajectory gets focused more and more and more, and we'll find more and more and more, on the um, timeline of perfection and longevity and eternal life, you experience lo loss and death and grief from other consciousnesses that you love and are attached to being focused away from you. But at a certain point, when you go through that wormhole and when you get to infinity and you have that I am God moment, aha, I'm God, I remember, you're totally overlapping again with every single person who you loved, who has died, who has focused away from you. You will refocus and re-encounter your cat, your dog, your loved ones, that tree, anyone or anything that died because it's actually at infinity and you're actually at infinity. And from their viewpoint, you died. So um, let's use my cat as an example. On the timelines where she stayed alive, where she didn't go outside and get, um, you know, in a, uh, like attacked by another animal and die, I died. Maybe I went out for cat food one day on the highway and I got hit by that Mack truck and I never came back. She stayed alive. I'm the one who died because my timelines had to focus away from the timelines of death. And then she, whatever, had to be adopted by someone else and have a different life experience. However, she stays alive and becomes an ascended master at infinity. I stay alive and become an ascended master at infinity. And at infinity, we um, re-encounter one another again. And of course, share stories. 
and we share the viewpoints of what it was like to go through all of these processes of refinement. This on an intellectual level can help to give some, um, shed some light on and give some, can, can, the better word is contextualize. This can contextualize what death actually is in the sense of not a smackdown or a smiting or some kind of harm from a deity that wants to take things away from you, but that is part of the structure of time as time is coming into a course correction for all of us. Melissa says, so every non-death timeline is not the same timeline, but rather many different ones. Good question. In each life vortex, there is one non-death timeline, but it's not necessarily overlapping with all of the other organisms in existence. So on my non-death timeline, there will be trees, however, so it's not, it's not like saying everything around you is going to die and you will be the only organism left alive. No, there will be trees and there will be butterflies and there will be cats in general, but my particular cat that I became attached to was not on my timeline of um, continued life and non-death. And same thing with her. There are humans and nice people on her non-death timeline, but I wasn't one of them. That's a hard lesson to experience because we both got attached to each other and then had to focus apart. So um, the non-death timelines actually exist as a type of dandelion head array. Many, 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 many of these lines that create kind of like a whole sphere that are all pointing inward towards the source, that everything has been emitted outward into physicality experience, and then everything is converging back from these various different points back towards the, that source that emitted them. Um, but there are definitely still other alive organisms on your journey as you are moving towards eternal life. And I think that's important too, because just if you are an ascended master and you're going to be a coherent eternal life being, it doesn't mean that you're surrounded by corpses or dead things or on a planet that's incinerated or anything like that. I have to hop in my car to my next angelic assignment soon, but let me just make sure that I get through everything that's important in my notes. I did, I call this part overlapping journeys. And I sent this out as part of the um, notes for the class that's also in, uh, I'll, I'll send as the archive too for everyone. So basically the transferring of attention from the periphery to the center and the transferring of attention from periphery to center is a refocusing of your possibilities and who, who you actually are as a person and your characteristics. And it also can cause some temporal suffering, meaning, from being submerged in time. You have suffering because you don't have the things and people that have died from your perspective, but they have focused their awareness away from where you are, but they still exist in another parallel dimension. And then just as you can receive information and um, uplift from different versions of yourself in parallel dimensions, they still actually exist in parallel dimensions and you can still get information, uplift and have a rapport with them, but they don't live in the same timeline that you live with. So I call re receiving cautionary information and impressions from peripheral selves. Um, got this already. Your third eye rests upon a platform of unconditional love, the capacity to accept what we see and perceive through here. And um, the visionary information that comes from here makes this heart coherence stronger. That's even bigger. So if this is a fire, like, you know, a burning, beautiful fire of compassion, then this information that we see from this energy coming up and coming to here gives us more fuel for this fire. The fire becomes brighter and even more intense. And this is how, like, my love, compassion has become even more intense for being able to comprehend the refocusing of energy onto different timelines towards the center away from the periphery and also peripheral selves like when you see someone who's in profound drug addiction or other things that are going on that are, it's a distortion of their self but I look at them and I say that is a peripheral version of themselves that's not even the real them they are actually a person that is many 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 timelines away from this that that's what their real face and their real communications really look like Pedro says I know that timeline where everything is dead it's a chapter of Doctor Who oh my goodness how week. I think I have to see that. It's a good show. Um, and um, time symmetry, the concept of time symmetry. So every single one of these time structures that exists 
why is an egg shaped like an egg? Why is a soap bubble shaped like a soap bubble? Why are these chakras shaped the way they are? Because there's a balance of forces that creates a level of stability that is not present in other shapes. So I told you my little anecdote, I had the eggs in the back of my car and it stopped short and the groceries came forward. And I was like, oh no, I'm gonna have to pick up a lot of broken eggs and a mess in my car. But I went and I looked in the back seat, none of the eggs broke, you know why? Because they're shaped like eggs and they are a miraculous shape that is designed to um, disperse forces so that birds can stay alive, so that they can gestate and stay alive. So um, yeah, it's an, the amazing shape of the egg is that it um, has a structural integrity to it that protects the little tiny lives that are inside of it. And it's the same thing with your chakras, that there is a structural integrity and a symmetrical balance to your chakras that exists for a reason and for a purpose. And that these, um, basically what you're doing when you're choosing, uh, so I know I'm like going fast because I only have a few more minutes at the end of this lesson because I have something else I have to get to. Um, but if you check out the recorded lessons on Teachable, I go into this extensively. What is meditation? Meditation is the conscious reclamation of the actions and movements of your mind because it's actually the thoughts that are in your mind that make your eye look over here and now look over here, 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 look over here. And there's a thought pattern. And if you think your thoughts in the right pattern, then you're going in these beautiful undulative movements that keep you on the longevity timelines. But when you're fractured and thinking in all these different directions that are not coherent, good music, like good music that keeps going and plays on and on and on, um, what happens is uh, you don't have coherence, you don't have longevity and you end up hitting the membrane of death. So that's what I mean by playing wrong notes. But it may, might also feel like, oh no, I thought the wrong thought, I'm gonna go off a cliff. No, it's not like that at all. You have the opportunity for course correction. So um, meditation is a practice, just like you practice the piano to get better and better at it. You practice meditation to get better at it. Meditation was a lot easier for me 10 or 15 years ago before all of the 5G Bluetooth crapola. Frequency, war, Blight is a good word for it. Um, the things that have come into our world that have been errant thought signals, that sometimes it's not even enough to be like, I politely decline, I don't want any of your junk food. Sometimes it's like the junk food is being beamed into my head and I can't get it the F out of me. Um, so very, very challenging to be in a sea of thought junk food at times. Please remain strong and please remain focused. Know that it will not always be this way. And also know that like the compassion of your heart will be strengthened when you get the insight as, as to why is this happening? Just like you might not have been able to comprehend what is going on with the, the death, why did my cat die? I was just extremely sad, but I'm sorry if there's loud barking out there, but I have been able to achieve more contextualization to be able to have more heart coherence as to the meaning, purpose, or context circumstances of why this exists. But when you're in it, not that much fun to have to experience it. And that essentially what we're doing with our thoughts when we move through time is um, learning to play the symphony of life and creating a coherent, well-structured thought body. And that well-structured thought body is like a ship of consciousness that is a uh, watertight when you put it on the ocean and the ocean is the ocean of consciousness. So what is our purpose for being alive right now is the refinement of consciousness, the refinement of your personality characteristics, getting everything that you are in terms of a time presence in alignment with who you are as God, the divine presence, and all of this for the purpose of the time when you will quote unquote set sail, when you will no longer have a physicality presence, not only through death, but also through the process of ascension, your physicality structure is no longer a viable structure, but your consciousness structure, the music of who you are, continues. And when you have a well-formed well vessel, it continues onward. And so that is basically what, what you're learning how to do here. You're creating a well-formed vessel. Your mind is a hacked operating system. I'm just gonna go through this fast and we'll go into this more later in the semester. OS, your operating system, is the foundation platform upon which all of the apps or subsets of learning run. So your operating system of being a human here and especially of using language structures in your mind is hacked. 
It's not innate to who you are and it's not intentional and it is opens you up to levels of vulnerability from external control, not necessarily the positive intention from the brochure and the pamphlet that you read in coming into this body and into this experience. Backdoors from software programmers, genetic vulnerabilities where your mind is accessible to the ones who created and implanted the system long ago. I talk about this also with allusions reverberating from the work of Carlos Castaneda, Don Juan de Castaneda talking about um, the flyer's mind. And I'll share that in subsequent lessons also, the idea of that uh, human mind is not, human mind is, does not originate from humans and does not serve humans in its purpose, but that it makes humans vulnerable to these hackers or those who would wish to drain you of energy, eat you as food in human years and um, reclaiming what the hackers have hacked. We do this through inner silence, even though I know it can be very challenging in a world where there are many thoughts that are even like synthetic telepathy beamed into your mind, recognize what they are. Do not eat them off of the plate, recognize what they are. And then also my big thing that I do now is I focus entirely on light. I focus entirely on nutrition. So in my meditations and in my daily practices, it's not just that I'm like, Mm, I'm sitting here thinking nothing because when you sit and you meditate stuff comes across and then mostly you disassociate and you say like that's not me that's not me I'm not thinking those thoughts where did those thoughts come from it doesn't matter just don't think about them but what I do now is very positively and purposefully focus on light I focus on the consciousness that is pure light that comes from the sun and the stars which is where I originate from and where I'm still connected I focus on light as a phenomenon even light coming out of my light bulb that I'm pointing to over here is indirect truth so even in this world of technological miasma, we do still get exposed to indirect or diluted levels of truth. And I did a nice um, whiteboard teaching that I shared on my YouTube about that. Two levels of reality, the miasma distorted false light reality, and then a world of coherent, beautiful, pure light truth that is undiluted and that remains coherent and pure. And just seeing the partial view that we have down here right now as being an emanation of that truthful totality view, I keep focusing on light. And I've been getting very good results and very good levels of inner freedom by that practice. So for me, what works now in this time place is meditation, not merely as a stilling of the mind and not a mindfulness and watchfulness, but a very intentional entrainment and focusing on light, which is information, which is intelligence, which is awareness, that I would invite you and encourage you to develop a similar practice. And I got epigenetics where your DNA is a potential, but that potential is not a fate, that a lot of your willpower, consciousness, thought structure, and other um, um, intentions of your being are what really determine what pathway you take. And then we'll get into this more in class, flying rainbow lasagna as a tool for rewriting pathways. If you're like, everything on the menu here is disgusting. I don't want any of it. Let's talk to the kitchen and rewrite the, the recipes of reality to make something much more palatable. So, oh my goodness, I have to get into everything. I have to tell you about chromatin. We'll do that next time. Big um, emphasis here, your mind is an antenna. So your DNA is an antenna. It is a transceiver. It both transmits and receives. Your spine my spine just went up, is an antenna. Your whole neurology both transmits and receives. That means that you are sending out thought form patterns. You're also receiving thought form patterns that all of these exist within a larger sea of harmonics, which is this ocean of consciousness, and that um, there is a large connection between the activities and perceptions of your mind, thoughts, consciousness, and the behavior of your DNA. All of those twistings and undulations and splicings and unsplicings happen in the patterns they do because of how we think. So it's not just fatalism where something happens because it's written inside of me. You're really an active participant and you can be very, very responsible in the sense of consciously choosing what you're thinking about and what you're aligning with so that your DNA then begins to exemplify those ideal forms that you want to be a part of. And moving away from thoughts of doubt criticism, criticism of the self and others, negativity, which it can be perceived as complaining about others or complaining about life and just the general life situation and judgmental thoughts, because all of those things are basically about like your heart closing instead of acceptance and energy flowing through the CPU. It's saying like, that's not supposed to be there. And I don't want that. And I don't want that. And I'd strongly disapprove of that, even though it's appropriate to strongly disapprove of things that are not supposed to be in existence. Um, all of those thought forms drain energy from here 
And then you don't necessarily have the gas to go in your car of awareness to go up to here. That's why it is just a simple practicality. You, if you have $100 of awareness, you can spend it complaining about others and complaining about life, the life situation and judging everything as being wrong. Or you can take those $100 and you can actually put them into what are the things that I need to learn about right now in order to create greater longevity and coherence in my journey? What's going to keep me going on my journey? Constant self-doubt and self-criticism and self-complaining or complaining about others. Or is there something better and more nourishing for me to spend that thought energy on? Those thoughts that are the positive things to think about, that's the nourishing food, not junk food. The other stuff is junk food. Some junk food is just distraction. And some junk food is basically elevating yourself. Like I'm, I'm better than you. I will feel better by looking down on you. You don't want to do that or just criticizing other people. Or like I said, just criticizing the situation. Um, I love this. Melissa says real warriors dance like an FRL. I love it. I, I truly appreciate you. I thank you for that positive energy. Thank you. And she says, I put some links in Discord from what you mentioned during this lesson. Thank you so much. Really appreciate, Melissa, your work and your voice in the Discord chat. And I encourage everyone to be a part of that Discord chat. And if I haven't already shared it, I will get the link and I will share it um, to everyone in, the, in this class um, over, um, over the archive. How about that? I have to say, good. I actually did get to the end of my notes. Um, uh, uh, what's coming up in next uh, preview of what's coming up next thoughts as living creatures not just that I'm a crudite on a plate but these are actual living creatures that you think about whether you want them to come inside of you whether you want to make love with them or to them whether you want to give birth to them and also the concept that any place where you have a, a torus shape like in the coiling of your DNA you can turn it into a flying rainbow lasagna all of that is just um, the appetizer for what will come next. And I truly have to sign off right now or, or complete everything right now so I can hop in my car. Love back to you. Love received. Love back to you. In profound gratitude, thank you for everyone who's attenuating and eating positive, healthy lasagna. Thank you, Joanne. You're very welcome for um, being here in my class and for listening to these thoughts. Thank you very much, everyone.